<laughs> What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Renee, joined in studio by Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. And we've got very special guests this week. Megan Scavio is here. Very special, Yay. Megan Scavio. Hello. Yes. Thank you so much for making time to Thank come you. down during the Game Developers Conference. I know it's usually a very busy week for you. It is, but I broke my toe a couple weeks ago, so I'm taking it easy, and this is actually a really good, good excuse to sit down. And I will take any excuse that I can get because I've been wanting to have you on the show forever. So for people who aren't familiar with Megan, she is the president of the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, which just put on DICE, the DICE Summit, and the DICE Awards to happen just a couple of weeks ago. It did, and uh, God of War was a big winner that night. It was. Surprise. We just had Corey here Surprise. just a couple of days ago. If you guys have missed that special episode, thank you for the segue, by the way. Oh, perfect. Um, you guys can download that on your favorite podcast app, or of course you can find the video at YouTube.com com slash what's good games we had Corey in here when we chatted for a little over 45 minutes about the talk that he's giving at gdc this week and of course he's up for more awards at the gdc awards which are happening tonight so by the time you guys listen to this episode the winners will have already been decided how many do you think Corey is going to take home tonight uh, most of them but <laughs> i have to say it's where, you know i just love how much he cares about his team and he brought his entire team to the dice awards so every different category they won they the team came up and accepted the awards and then gave him applause and accolades and it just it's a feel good story i'm really proud of that whole team yeah so I, I don't mind that they win everything yeah that's what the what i think what people are kind of in unison about is that they are a studio that clearly has a lot of heart and has worked a really long yeah. time. And not to say that other studios that are nominated mm -hmm. don't. Correct. You know, like I had a really fun conversation with Brian Intihar from Insomniac Games about always being the bridesmaid and never the bride oh, <laughs> no. for, for Spider-Man. Because, oh, no. you know, I was happy they at least so took home sad. something at the yeah. DICE Awards. It's hard when you go up against... So when there's so many good titles in the same year, it's hard. You never, you just never know. Someone's you just have to release it. your game in a crappy year for everything else, yeah. right? Be sweet. And that way you are the star <laughs> of the show. <laughs> yeah, just, just sit on it for a while. But there's never going to be another crappy year, I don't think. I, I feel know. like video games obviously have you know, a little bit of ebb and flow, but it seems like more often than not in the last five years, there just hasn't been a down year. I mean, innovation is it's incredible in our industry, and we see something new every year. Even God of War, when it, you think... It's an old game. It's not. It's new. And it's Papa Kratos is back. Exactly. Well, we are going to dive into so many topics with Megan on the show this week. But before we get to that, we have just a little bit of housekeeping. We already reminded you about Corey's special episode. We're once again reminding you PAX East is quickly approaching on the horizon. We've got the What's Good Games Live panel happening Thursday, March 28th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time in the Bobcat Theater. If you are going to be in Boston for PAX, it's going to be awesome. Plus, we've got our meet and greet on Saturday, March 30th from 2 to 4 p.m. at King's Entertainment. And that is just a short walk from the convention center. You don't need a badge to come to the meet and greet, and you can be any age you want. That's right. It's our very first all-ages <laughs> show. Aww. So we've always done 21 <laughs> plus. I'm going to so choose, choose, choose your age. age. 18. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if you are planning to consume alcoholic beverages, you do need to bring an ID as you, yeah, as you have to do. So. Did you hear that a lot of people were missing out because they couldn't, they weren't old enough to go? Well, we did get a lot of feedback from people asking, you know, when are you going to do an all ages well, meetup? Nice. So Good. we thought now's the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give the kids a chance. Bring exactly. Your around us. Exactly. Bring or even the kids that are close to being 21, but not quite there right. yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but we do have a lot of parents that watch the show. And of course, PAX is such a great community yeah. and family oriented show to go to. So we have parents that are bringing their kids to the show, but then they're like, well, what am I supposed to do with my kid when I go to the meet and greet? Yeah. Now you can bring them with. I'm Perfect. just waiting for that moment when the parent comes with their little child. And they're like, we love your show. And it's and like, you're like, oh, oh no, you little baby, we're, we're corrupting you. <laughs> we're corrupting your young children. <laughs> Sorry. It's That's true. Okay. We're corrupting Hashtag forces. Hashtag role models. Um, so if you guys <laughs> want to find out more yes. about what's happening um, at PAX, of course, be sure to follow us on Twitter at what's good underscore games. I believe we've got an event page up on our Facebook. Negative. Not yet. No. Is this because I haven't provided you with the artwork <laughs> yet? Maybe. Maybe this is my fault, you guys. Whoops. You've been busy. Yeah, GDC is happening. Maybe by the time the show airs, it will be live. Maybe. Maybe. Negative. Who's to say? Roll the dice and go check it. And if it's there, cool. If it's not, <laughs> then whatever. Also, if you are a patron planning on coming, let us know. We may or may not have drink tickets. It's true. 
They might fall magically from the sky. Yeah. Speaking of Patreon, thank you, Brittany, for reminding me. We had a Patreon town hall last weekend. Thank you to everybody who showed up, who upped their pledge, who became a patron for the first time. We're really excited about the streamlining and the changes that we made to our membership program. If you guys want to find out all about the new membership tiers, we've got Rare epic legendary mythic memberships that we're offering now you can go to patreon.com slash what's good games we've got a little video up there for you and we've got a long post detailing everything you could possibly want to know about the membership options for what's good games Britt, did you have anything else to add about our patreon town hall we have an ad free version of the podcast hey oh my gosh the biggest news that i completely forgot this is why i keep you around i'm glad i have some purpose i'm still (laughs) 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 so what tier is that that is the epic Epic. tier yeah epic membership and above gets you an audio version of the podcast without any ads yes Mm. our most requested feature yeah is now yours to be had for just five dollars a month woo no ads. Woo! That's actually speaking really of good ads, deal. right? Yeah, that's actually a pretty good deal. <laughs> I thought so too. Go to my computer, yeah. yes. you can't barely even get a cup of coffee for five bucks now. No. But you can get the What's Good Games podcast, two hours of bad free content every week. <laughs> it's oh gonna be God. great. Simon's not having it. Oh, it's just, no. Speaking of ads. <laughs> Before we get into the news, and there was a ton of news to talk about this week, I'd like to say thank you to our sponsors, MeUndies, Quip, and Grammarly for supporting the show. And first up, we've got some details about a special offer from MeUndies. Ask yourself this one very important question. Is your underwear making you happy at this very moment? Or were you not even thinking about your underwear? Wouldn't you like to be wearing underwear that is so soft that you feel like you're making love to an actual cloud all day long? Oh well, I've got one word for you. Me undies. That's incredible. BuzzFeed said this, said this about me undies. They feel like actual heaven against your skin. We're going to assume heaven is really soft in this context. <laughs> Ask Men said they feel like silk drenched in hand lotion. <sighs> Not only will you feel like your loins are being hugged by joy itself, but Me Undies gives you multiple style options for both men and women. Choose between classic colors to adventurous prints, like the significant otters, plant babies, and shamrocks, which Britt and I tweeted a photo of our shamrock socks last mm-hmm. week. Me Undies is also the go-to for the softest loungewear on this side of the Mississippi. Hang out in their super comfy lounge pants and onesies. Yes, Me Undies makes onesies, and they're incredible. Britt. I can vouch for this. You just got a new one. I got an incredible onesie covered in strawberries. It was so cute. I had to go buy my own yeah and <laughs> it is story. like legit this time and i have we've had this conversation where you know you borrowed a onesie of mine and you slept yes. in and you woke up and literally ripped it off of you because you were it was, suffocating i was and suffocating hot, it was so hot yep yeah. and i've been sleeping in this thing um for a few nights now it needs to be washed badly but <laughs> um it's so comfortable and it's so thin and it, it's material i feel it's breathable like yeah breathable i'm making micro modal fabric i'm a big Ooh, onesie yeah. fan yeah uh, we sold onesies at gdc because i love onesies but I wouldn't sleep in a onesie. Like, I think that's but lounge wear. Now, They're yeah. lounge wear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, but, but then now. you just like roll in and out of bed. Because it's not bulky. It's not heavy and sweaty. It's just like, it's like another a layer of skin. All right. I'm normally with you about not sleeping in the onesie because I also get way too hot in bed for it. Yeah. But this. These are special yeah. This fabric. If you are interested in putting this smooth, silky, micromodal fabric on your body, well, we've got a great offer for you. For first time purchasers, when you order a Me Undies item, you will get 15% off and free shipping this is a no-brainer you guys get 15 percent off a pair of the most comfortable undies or onesie you'll ever put on to get your 15 percent off free shipping and a 100 percent satisfaction t- guarantee go to meundies.com slash wgg that's m-e-u-n-d-i-e-s dot com slash wgg for 15 percent off and free shipping Woo! all right i'm glad you mentioned gdc because something that a lot of people might not know about you is that you used to be the gm of gdc ah uh, yeah i've been my first gdc was in 2000 and i've uh the, my last one was two years ago do you get a little like teary-eyed when you come back i do it's <laughs> i you know i i well i don't get to go wherever i want any longer which is what kind of they don't give you like a like an all access bag? Like an well, honorary bag. Like, i can't go into closed rooms like go into yeah. the rooms where nobody knows who i am and um, yeah no but GDC, it's an it's it's evolved, and I'm actually really kind of sad because it's doing so much better since I left. <laughs> oh no! I was really hoping it would fail just a tiny little bit. Oh, but it's actually improved. But you planted improved. the seed, you I, made the foundation, and sure, now look yes, at it's growing. I will take credit for that. Yeah, a tree keeps growing after you're it gone. Does. 
But I love seeing the things that you really champion when you were the GM. Like one of the things that always sticks out to me right away are the pronoun ribbons that are on people's badges, Mm. which I think is really great because being inclusive was something that is still kind of elusive to the games industry. Well, I read a tweet the other day from someone who said, I went to GC in 2014 and it was my nightmare. I didn't feel comfortable. There was no one there like me. And now this is my first time coming back since then. And it's filled with people like me and I feel so at home. And I think that I'm not saying I did all of that, but we started offering a lot of new scholarships. So we started, you know, the only way you're going to, you know, change diversity is to make it happen. So we gave people free passes to GDC underrepresented developers to just just come just fill the halls i don't care if you didn't pay this i want you there and i think that prompted this this new um they feel safe there now so i'm really happy about that the gdc is a different beast than it was five years ago oh absolutely this is my 10th gdc covering it as media and um it's crazy to watch how much has grown and evolved over the years and even just going to the women in gaming event that microsoft puts on every year we went it to the rally out. yeah and so like and it's gotten so big yes. because i i remember going to it when it was just like this little luncheon <laughs> and i really liked the luncheon too it was a really nice format where you got to get to know just a small group of people mm. at a table setting but now with the rally like hundreds of female developers from all across the industry get to really experience it and they have the game changers program where they give scholarships to students um and things like that it was really wonderful to see look out over that audience and see so many different types of women from all different walks of the game industry really kind of come together i like to say that they're they're not all new they've always been there right now they're they're more visible and they're showing that they're here and that's what i love is that they feel comfortable going Look, I make games. And hopefully even more people out there will continue to be comfortable making games because while we've made so many great strides, still got a ways to go. Still a few (laughs) steps to take, yeah. Um, But looking towards the future, well, let's get into our first news story. Of course, the news of the week that everybody is talking about. Oh, boy. Google Stadia. So let's talk about this name first and foremost. What do we think about Google calling their new streaming platform Stadia? I personally think it sounds like an STD. (laughs) <laughs> or like a medicine for an STD? Yeah, or some sort of disease. Or a coffee sweetener, as Megan said. Is it I, Google Stevia? I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't relate that to my favorite sweetener, but uh, Stevia is very good, better than regular sugar. Um, I don't mind the name. Stadium, they want people to relate to the fact that, you know, massively multiplayer games will be running through their service. And that makes more sense. I didn't, until earlier today during lunch, you said, or was it you, that it said it's the plural of stadium? Right. Well, they did this really neat intro video when they kicked off the announcement right. showing like, the history of humanity and the history of games and looking all the way back to like the Olympic games or looking at sporting events mm-hmm. as games and then down to other types of competitive events. And obviously, you know, fast forward to 2019, we think about stadiums and esports mm-hmm. and how so many people around the world kind of gather in these stadiums to watch other people play video games and it's really been this crazy kind of evolution thinking back to like what the first olympics was to what like a stadium at like lcs or like the international Mm -hmm. is right it's really um a a neat play on words i don't know how i feel about it as like a platform name but i think that's maybe more because what is this platform question mark yeah and there have been some weird console names out there we were talking about like the wii for example. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like Xbox, right? There are lots Xbox of things one. we've made fun of when they were announced. And then yeah. you get used to It's something to we all do. We all <laughs> make phone. For, Except for the Ooh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's not the I still phone. make fun of Ooh, yeah. yeah. Good nickname for it. <laughs> Xbox One Sad Edition. So if you don't know what we're talking about, let me read a little bit of a breakdown here from GameSpot.com. So after months of rumors and speculation... Google announced during the game developers keynote in San Francisco that rather than a console, they revealed Stadia, cloud gaming, cloud claiming, a cloud enough. gaming platform that allows users to stream games to any device. The GDC 2019 presentation showcased what it's capable of as well as the controller Google has designed for it, the first party developer it's established, and much more. So that controller that was leaked, air quotes, was, um, wrong. was wrong only in color. The form factor and the button layout matched. Mm. What were so, the, but the bottoms weren't as square, were they? Well, when you saw all of the different concept pieces of concept art, it looks pretty close. The controller does look a little bit thicker than it did in those original pieces of concept mm. art. But, I mean, the the kind of, like, really more angular knobs on each side still look 
the same. But people so, don't hate this controller as much as the true the patents. Right. Yeah, yeah, saw. exactly. So we'll get to the controller in just a, sta- a second. So Stadia is built around the natural advantages of being a streaming platform. For example, Google showed a seamless switching between various devices, similar to Nintendo Switch's different play modes. This also means that the games can be played at high fidelity, regardless of the device. Now, I I'm just going to add an aside that I don't agree with this analogy. No, of, me neither. I was similar like, to mm-hmm. Nintendo Switch's yeah. different play modes. This is not Absolutely that is not a not fair no. comparison at all. And um, so let me continue. This also means that games can be played at high fidelity regardless of the device. At launch, it will stream 4K at 60 frames per second with sound and HDR support. In the future, Google is planning to support 8K resolution and frame rates upwards of 120 frames per second. So we're talking about PC quality here. Since the actual rendering is being done through a server farm, developers are encouraged to take advantage of the extra processing power. One tech demo showed real-time destructible environments. Crackdown 3. Another showed a multiplayer game that fed several videos into a single-player stream. And two consumer-facing features features state share and crowd play are aimed at encouraging interaction between friends and between streamers or audiences state share lets you create moments for friends or stream viewers to play from exactly the same moment in a game crowd play lets streamers form a queue of viewers who can jump in and play a multiplayer game with them though the presentation was ostensibly for a dedicated gaming platform google has not yet announced very many games its software's marty stratton did appear on stage to promise doom eternal will come to stadia in q games dylan cuthbert suggested he's working on a game built around the state share feature tequila works as luz 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 sancho appeared on stage but did not commit to a specific game that was a really weird moment yeah there's she like was, she was dressed really nicely she though. was oh, yeah. she, she looked fly outfit. but i was like so why did you come here is there something you're announcing or are you just looking fly on stage <laughs> um former ea and studio and ubisoft studio head jade raymond is also heading up the newly formed stadia games and entertainment division which will create first party games the studio will also work with third party developers to use the technology ubisoft is also likely on board having helped test project stream last year with assassin's creed odyssey and on pc you can play stadia through existing Existing supported controllers. Google is also releasing its own specialized Stadia controller that we talked about. It has a few extra buttons, such as the smart device detection, a share button, and a Google Assistant button. Steimer note, it also connects via Wi-Fi. Yes. So this is an important note to bring up because Wi-Fi doesn't have a history of being the most stable of wireless connections across the planet. Mm. I would say that Bluetooth is inarguably a more stable connection than Wi-Fi, but the reason why people are thinking it's exciting that it's Wi-Fi is because in, instead of connecting directly to the hardware, you're going to be connecting via Wi-Fi directly to Google's network. And so your controller is hypothetically, if I'm understanding this correctly, communicating directly with Google servers versus a piece of hardware communicating with oh, another piece of hardware. Sure. Uh, so yeah. that's why it's kind of like, Makes ooh, sense fancy. Yeah. yeah. So we don't quite know exactly how the tech's going to work. This is very much just a, hey, we're here um, kind of announcement. But I think we all left with more questions than we began with. And they, of course, have a roadmap. They, they have the whole year planned out where they will make the announcements that they need to make. Yes. So they're doling information out to us. Yes. Yeah. The one thing that was like the most notably absent was anything about pricing. And then the one thing that sort of irritated me a little is they were like, this is exactly how it works. And I was like, no. No. (laughs) Because like, even if you hit a join game button when you're watching a streamer, at some point you would theoretically pay, right? Like, so what's the user flow of me being like, oh, I don't have this game to now I am jumping in with said streamer. There's got to be a pay point at some yes, point. Yes, I do believe you'll have to either buy the game or the uh, the game maker will have a demo, uh, some sort of demo that you can jump into. Or if you, it's a subscription based thing, right? Where you're or just if constantly it's that, logged yeah. In, so like, right? there's there's so many unknowns in terms <laughs> yeah. of like how you actually pay for this stuff, but. Yeah, and that was my biggest um, complaint when I was tweeting during the reveal. So Steimer and I watched the uh, announcement, the keynote together, and. I wanted to be clear. I think that this is a super exciting technology. I don't think that this is something that is so revolutionary that we haven't seen before because this is essentially what OnLive was hoping to do Mm -hmm. when they first came onto the market. Obviously, we got a little bit more bells and whistles because we have the YouTube integration. We've got the live streaming integration. And then, of course, the AI part of it with Google Assistant. But I'm a little still on the fence about how I feel about all of that stuff. I don't think OnLive made it work. No, they clearly didn't, right? Google's going to make it work. Well, they've got Google the money to do something. Yeah. There's a company that can make it work. <laughs> and when was on live? How long ago was that? Like eight years ago, yeah, I believe. Yeah, obviously, like a different time. But yeah, and so I, because they also didn't talk about what the uh, connection needed to be to make this work. So either here's an article from IGN. 
where it says Google Stadia, the newly revealed game streaming service, recommends a 25 megabits per second internet connection to provide 1080p 60 frames per second gameplay. The requirements for the service are detailed in an interview Kotaku did, and they said we use less than that, but that's where we put our recommended limit at. And then to get to, okay, when we launch, we will be able to get to 4K, but only raise that bandwidth to about 30 megabits per second. That's a pretty intense internet speed with average speeds across the United States being 15 to 20 megabits. Obviously, there are some areas that have better access. Like I'm one of the lucky few that has access to fiber here at the What's Good Game studio in the Bay Area. So I can get a thousand megabits per second up and down. So many megabits. But like that is an anomaly, right? I would say most people are paying for around 10 to 20 megabits per second. I mean, and think about how much we travel. I mean, I, <laughs> you've been in as many hotel Wi-Fi situations as I have. Like, it's usually like two to five if you're lucky. Yeah, it's real bad. Yikes. But that just means you're not playing in 4K. Right. You're playing, you're playing at a lower, lower well, resolution. Well, 1080p is, is, oh, is the 25. Uh, uh, uh. So, I mean, and not every game is at 1080p, but for the most part, if you're playing a video game, you expect it to be at 1080p now. So I had tweeted, you know, like, of course, Google was going to bring the goods when it comes to tech. Of course, they're going to support 4K 60 frames per second because who's launching a new gaming platform that doesn't, right? Uh, Nintendo. Um, (laughs) But... Nintendo's not doing their own thing. Right. (laughs) Nintendo can do whatever they want. Right. And so I, I think Nintendo is a good... Um, example of how something like Stadia could work by not necessarily going on trend. But I think where I'm concerned is that Nintendo has come from decades of mm. established first-party software, and their first-party software is what sells their hardware through and through every generation that Nintendo sees success. Mm. It's because people love Mario. People love Smash Brothers. People love, you Zelda. know, Zelda, right? And yeah. and so I think in Pokemon, right? Animal Crossing. Exactly. Oh, yeah. it, we could just, we could keep going because they have such a s- amazing collection and library of software, and that's what Google is missing. And obviously, they've brought Jade on um, to head up the studio. Megan, what do you think about Jade and her position and what she can bring to the table for Stadium? I mean, Jade Jade is a game maker. She started her career as a programmer. Can we just start? Because you just called it Stadium. Oh. I said Stadia. Oh, I thought you said Stadium. Well, I mean, the we, word itself, if I was mumbling, I apologize. No, because I was like, let's start like a, a tip jar where whenever one of us calls it by the wrong <laughs> name or Stadium, that we like put something in a jar. Yes. That's all I'm saying. So strike one for Andrea. Continue. I said Stadia. It might have been mumbled. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank sorry, you. I, know, I, was, sorry. I have no dog in this race. <laughs> Uh, so Jade Jade is a seasoned game developer, and she has been wanting to make games her entire career. So she's going to take this and run with it and make everyone proud. I don't really know what else to say. I don't know any. I didn't know if she was going to Google until everyone else did. Uh, and I think that she's going to um, do some pretty exciting stuff. With your history, um, knowing so many game makers and game developers, how long do you think it's going to be with Jade just really coming into this role before something that she has really kind of pushed across the finish line is actually going to be playable? I mean, three years? Like a minimum, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Three years. So it'll be interesting to see what Google does with their partners because if they are going to launch this year, which they said they are, they're targeting 2019 mm-hmm. for launch, they clearly have to come at it with third-party partnerships. Steimer, mm-hmm. do you see a particular developer or publisher that is more poised to want to work with Google? I don't know. Why would Google's got lots of money. I'm sure they can... Make it rain on everybody. (laughs) I mean, they've also, everyone working for them are seasoned game developers. Phil Harrison, Mm -hmm. Jack Trenton, all these people behind the scenes are people that you've known. Wait, is Jack Trenton part of it? I, I you mean lie. Jack Puser? I, I mean Jack Puser. Okay, I was Thank like, did, I'm like, I'm pretty sure Jack turns off golf Jack somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, they have contacts. They have, you know, they, they're they're not going to have any problem. That's true. Mm-hmm. I've just heard some rumblings. Um, obviously, we've been taking the opportunity to ask anybody and everybody around GDC. So, what do you think about Stadia? Yeah. Um, and a lot of people are uh, rightly so very tight-lipped about it. Um, but we did just um, get to see um, a developer that I've known for a long time, and he'll remain nameless. And we asked him, you know, is the game that we're seeing today is it going to be coming to Stadia? Because it's very common for us to be like, you know, which platforms, and then like, why aren't you thinking about Switch? Is you know usually, usually a default question. <laughs> yeah. And then now it's like Stadia question mark, and 
clearly the people who have something to hide are like we're not discussing it yet but um this one developer who is running a recently formed studio said you know we're interested we just don't know what don't it know is think about it he's yeah. like like yeah. i found out most of the about the platform like everybody else did and he's like you know we're excited about the opportunity but you know we can't develop for a platform we don't understand right. Right. i also think it was so i'm like okay so stadia is a consumer platform it also is like sort of a game engine or at least seemed like it was kind of a game engine yeah. mm -hmm. i was like okay and then it's also a first party studio and i was like all right maybe you should like make these a little different but um it was I, a lot of info the, yeah, it was a lot and all in one conference but i think the part i found most confusing was the game development part because i was like wait are you asking developers to now develop for a separate third platform that has different specs than any of the others like none of xbox can't do these things playstation can't do these things stadia is technically the only one who can do some of it so like all those teraflops all and so you're so many like now that that would be just an extra step for them to try and consider and i don't know how much right. bigger studios yeah. are going to want to until they see that there's a value there yeah the absolutely base, right? yeah i'm trying to think is this something i would be interested in and it's hard to say because I think at this point we just don't know enough. Like how how am I gonna how are they gonna get my money is like the number one question. Right. I don't even know what my internet is at my house. I'm sure it's good enough to run something basic. I'm sure that's fine. But it's you know, I don't know if I'm ready to sacrifice a console for the convenience of this. I think that's the question. Am I ready to do that? Now if it gets to a point where I can have all of my games that easily maybe then I would think about because we travel all the time and obviously the switch right now is like a standalone piece of equipment and hardware that can handle that but when I'm on an airplane can I use go go in flight to to play oh my, my god right that's what I'm saying <laughs> definitely, no, not. definitely no. not so uh, you can't even pass. stream Netflix no. yeah so I just don't know yeah I don't think this is something I think the interesting I was talking when I was talking to you yesterday about it I'm like I think the interesting application here now obviously all this depends on your internet speed and where you live mm -hmm. but if you were a family that could not afford any of these other things, but like maybe someone in there still wants to experience these AAA gaming experiences, Stadia is a, is a tool that would allow for that. Right. Um, when you don't even need a nice computer at your house, you need just like a laptop of some kind right. and you can have that experience. I think that is what's really cool about it. I don't know. That's not incredibly applicable to any of us in this room mm -hmm. because we all do have the console. We have all the console. We have all the stuff, right? We're fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there are a lot of folks who don't now, again, like maybe they also don't have the internet connection. They would even need to use this, which is a separate issue. But, um, but does the lack of load times and load screens and all, is that an appeal to everybody? Does that, is, does that make a difference? I mean, yes, yes no. <laughs> in, the, in theory, right? So we saw them on stage do this really slickly rehearsed demo of them going from one platform to the next yep. and picking up where it left off. And we all know it's not going to work like that. I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer about it. It's just, it's not, right? So you're, there's going to be some kind of a login somewhere. You're going to have to boot it up. If you're playing it on your phone, people don't keep games open and running on their phone it drains your battery crazy right so you would have to like open up the app presumably log in um and then you would have to probably get to some kind of secondary screen um i, I in theory if it works i think it's really revolutionary i just would need to see it in practice to actually get my mm -hmm panties in a twist as yeah. Brittany likes to say yeah, I do like yeah to say that. Not, that was not the true <laughs> user experience it obviously was a was a true demo it was just highly scripted for the particular right. purpose but it could be a the next disruptor yeah for the games of course. absolutely and it can change everyone else's business model if you really don't need a console anymore then what how it's dare you yeah it's gonna be <laughs> interesting to see how the big three kind of pivot around this news right so obviously xbox has something in the wings mm -hmm. that's probably going to be very similar to what google is doing based yep. off all that we've heard from them so far so hopefully that reveal is coming in sometime in the next couple of months if not we'll know by e3 for sure yep. i have to imagine mm -hmm. um and then nintendo obviously marching to the beat of their own drum i highly doubt they're even going to dip their toes in these waters because they can't even get voice chat inside the nintendo switch so you have to do a separate app so the idea of them doing something with cloud-based server processing just seems completely too far gone for them so well, i think they're going to keep doing their own thing and keep selling hardware stuff in japan they did what was it Oh, Assassin's Creed was it um, Odyssey and Resident Evil Seven? They so they they're dabbling, but I don't think it's going to become a full fledged strategy for them. 
So I mean, at least they're they're doing. I love Nintendo. I love Nintendo. I mean, this I know is what you you're gonna too. play on the plane. Your Switch. <laughs> My Switch, <laughs> yeah. but not via the cloud. Yeah. 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 I think. Yeah, like you were saying, I think this is really cool, and I think it's really revolutionary. I think it's just look in practicality how does this work right now when right. you don't have all these internet speeds and i think you know this is something that someone's gonna have to start breaking ground on to, in order to kind of get it to there and i think that's what's happening it might not be totally perfect right now but at least those steps are being made because like simer said it's great if you don't want to have to buy a 400 dollars console yeah. yeah absolutely and i think right. playstation is really the one to watch here and how they're gonna pivot because they don't have something that they've announced that they're working on but we do know that like ps5 is coming probably pretty soon we can maybe get an announcement this year maybe it launches next year right and so like what are they going to do to adapt because their real dominance in this last generation has been their third-party partnerships mm -hmm. not to say that their first-party stable hasn't been excellent obviously it has like they have an amazing collection of first-party studios is that enough to carry people over to tell them to, they need to buy another box because you can't play god of war on google stadia somebody asked me that in a tweet and i was like no of course you can it's a, PlayStation it's a PlayStation 4 yeah. exclusive. Yeah. You can't play it on PC or Xbox or Switch. It's like you have to buy that box to play that game. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where PlayStation is really going to have to double down going into the next generation to say, if we're not going to, if we're not ready to explore streaming as a platform, you know, obviously they have PlayStation now, but we all know how that's been going for them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what do they have coming down the pipeline from their trusted studios to get people to reinvest in the hardware? I do wonder if their their foray into PlayStation now makes them maybe less concerned about Stadia. If they if they think to themselves, well, that didn't like light the world on fire, right? Like it still exists, but I don't no one's really talking about it anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what how many people use it. Do, does anybody? I don't know no, anybody no, yeah. that uses PlayStation uh, now. No. So like, I feel like maybe that would give them, I don't know if it's a false sense of security, but it right. probably more so than say Xbox who got eaten alive when they suggested anything remotely like this. As of yeah, May absolutely. of 2017, PSN now had 70 million monthly active users. Wow. How are they actually And that was a year ago. That was my a, question. That was, yeah, over, a year ago. over a year ago. Almost two almost, years ago. Almost two years ago. I wonder how, what I do wonder what their qualifier for that is though. Like someone who just logs into what, You're or active. are they downloading or are they yeah. not downloading? Are they streaming something? Anyways, whatever. so what anyway. semantics, what um, pay model do you think makes the most sense here? Subscription for sure. And based off what I've heard, that's the model that they're going to. I mean, obviously I don't have any concrete information. This is all hearsay, mm -hmm. but Google loves subscriptions. If you look at all of their other suites of services that they offer across tons of different verticals it's all subscription based right mm -hmm. so it would make sense to me that if you're going to do a streaming platform that you're going to have a streaming subscription what do you think megan i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's a great question even some of the developers that we've talked to this week like don't know mm -hmm. you know and like it seems to me that google has very strategically picked a key partners that they're working with that are still like very much behind closed doors discussions. Mm. But now that the name is out, you know, the concept is out, I think we're going to start getting like a drip feed of info. Totally. I do wonder what you would need. Well, I guess Xbox game pass is sort of doing that. Like what price point would you need in order to make it reasonable to release first, like triple a games day one right. in it mm -hmm. versus the PlayStation now, which kind of like, has older stuff typically right. and mm -hmm. sort of cycles through. That's what I'm wondering. Too. Um, so like, cause if I can only, if I'm just paying, I don't know, like a net, even a Netflix amount, which is what, 15 bucks a month. Um, but you're giving me every, or not every probably, but like a decent chunk of all third party, um, game releases day one. Like that's going to be crazy to pass up. I mean, yeah, I just think it's completely implausible. I think the idea that a developer like Activision, who sells 25 million plus units of Call of Duty a year, would give up that money that they get from selling it at $60 a right unit. Well. Yeah, no, I, I mean, they they're will. never going to go for no. a subscription model. Why no, would they? They don't no. need to. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm not completely sold on the subscription model. Yeah. I, I'm not, you know, I don't, I, I don't like guessing on these things. I really sure. want to hear them, hear what they have to say, but... I think um, you could have a mix. Or I was too. about to say, yeah, they could technically do both yeah. and have a sort of PlayStation Now curated experience that's subscription, mm -hmm. and then just also release games that you can purchase. purchase the license to obviously it's kind of like digital games now. Sure. Yeah. Or maybe anyway. it's like an EA access style where you get like 
a certain amount of hours of early access and then you have to buy the full game but you get it at a discount yeah. right so like you get like 10 hours to play the game and try it out and stream it um as part of your subscription and then you get like a 10 to 20 percent discount when you buy the full right. skew that could be something that works my too head, to my head is here. spinning man yeah. i don't yeah. know yeah yeah i mean obviously this is just all uh speculating no, it's fun hopefully be- we'll have more news <laughs> it's fun to speculate because this is such uncharted territory for the industry so it's fun to see what could happen where could this go well, it's not totally uncharted it's well, just this is probably the one company that can yes. do it. Right. Execute. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and they've like, been working on it for a long time. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, we have so much more GDC news to get to. So let's keep on a rolling. Uh, I'm going to kind of go through these next few stories pretty quickly since we um, do need to get back up to the conference so we can't have a super long show this week. Um, see if these anniversary updates celebrates the start of year two on April 30th. Wow. It's crazy to think that. It's been a full year now since yep. Sea of Thieves launched. We were so looking forward to this game, and they had a rough go, but they've really turned it around in these 12 months since launch. This I'm, is the one I'm interested in. Oh. Okay, so uh, Steimer <laughs> wrote this up from Xbox.com. Would you like to go over it? Sure. So, the anniversary update, I'm not going to sing song this time, sorry, um, <laughs> is a game changer that takes Sea of Thieves to a whole new level. Packed full of new content that's guaranteed to have something for everyone, tune into a series of live streams that will uh, share more details behind these things. So, on Wednesday, April 10th, wow, yes, I can read numbers, um, they're having an anniversary preview of the arena which is basically an all new competitive mode that'll let you and your friends test yourselves against other crew other crews in a fun and fast paced matches to like amass the most loot so like pvp ish stuff no thank you i think is a thing everybody yeah, at the yeah, table no would say not for me. Yeah. that's fine not <laughs> every pvp for, for me. us um april 16th they will be talking about the hunter's call which is a new trading company that gives you more ways to play and progress towards pirate legend so uh You'll find out more about what you can do, the company behind it, and the rewards on offer. And then the one I'm actually interested in is on Tuesday. The stream is on Tuesday, April 23rd. And that is a preview of Tall Tales, Shores of Gold. So this is Sea of Thieves, like you've never seen it before. Dude. Tall Tales are a collection of story-rich quests that are played out in our shared world and can be fully experienced by yourself or with your crew. Hmm. Will people still try to kill me, though? Don't know yet. That's a little fuzzy language. (laughs) This first collection, Shores of Gold, invites you to embark on an epic adventure of love, honor, and betrayal in search of the mythical Shores of Gold. Um, Yeah, so it's not really clear if people can still mess with you. Obviously, it says you are still in the shared world, um, but it is more of a story-focused quest line, which I'm interested in. Uh, Then they have a whole bunch of other stuff like to support the community for anybody who's been playing over the past year new mercenary voyages i believe let's see if you've attained pirate legend status during year one you get a golden tanker a whole bunch of golden things um which is fun and shiny and pretty um and anyways there's a whole bunch of different stuff that you'll get so if you've been playing sea of thieves i would encourage you to go check out um their post on xbox news yeah that's exciting I, thought, I feel like it was just yesterday, but it was around this time last year that we were talking about Sea of Thieves with Ka, remember? Yeah, yeah. with yeah. Khalif Adams. Yes, mm-hmm. spawn on me. Oh, I love that guy. He's yeah, he's wonderful. great. Yeah, he's the best. He's on vacation we're right cool now. We're cool with him, so we call him Ka. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, remember we were just talking about how we just wanted more content, and we knew as the time went on we would get that content, and I'm really excited about this too, Steimer. Shorts of Gold. Yeah. That sounds fun. I just hope I can't be killed by... Do you, do you play Sea of Thieves? I have not played Sea of okay. Thieves. Okay. I don't think it's PvP. as bad as maybe we i don't know we need to jump in and like test the waters literally yes yeah it's been a, a quite some time mm-hmm. since we've jumped in and really explored to see how the pvp has changed i know that server populations they've reconfigured quite a few times and really balanced them and they've added tons of more content and the game world seems to be all around working more smoothly as it tends to go with a games of service usually six to 12 months after launch is the prime time to play Mm -hmm. so um we will uh check it out and report back um next up epic game store exclusive metro exodus outsells previous game on steam (laughs) at launch 
So, Brittany, you want to uh, take this one? Of course I will. This comes from Polygon. Okay, I won't do that either. The, <laughs> the Epic Game Store is off to a promising start. Steve Allison, head of the Epic Game Store, shared some download and sales data during a presentation at the 2019 Game Developers Conference, noting that users downloaded the free games Subnautica and Slime Rancher four and a half million times in two weeks. But the real news comes from the launch of Metro Exodus, an Epic Games Store exclusive. Metro Exodus has sold two and a half half time yeah two and a half times more copies on the epic game store than metro last light sold in the same amount of time on steam this proves according to allison that quote it's really about your game and not so much about the store you sell it on not only are the sales larger but metro publisher deep silver will keep more of the revenue the epic game store takes 12 percent of the revenue from game sales while steam takes 30 percent of the revenue for the first 10 million in sales after which valve's cut drops to 25 percent and then down further to 20 percent after 50 million in sales Metro Exodus also runs on the Unreal Engine 4, which means that the engine licensing fees will come out of Epic's 12% cut instead of being added on top of Steam's 30% revenue share. That's really great <laughs> news for 4A. That's wonderful. I remember yeah. Yeah. people are, we're going to boycott this game. We're not going to buy it. And, uh, look what happened. I mean, I think it's probably just people like typing to Google Metro, like how do, where do I get it? And then they just, it's, there's one place. Yeah. Wait, why were they going to boycott it? Because it was originally was listed on Steam and then 4A and Deep Silver pulled it off ah, of Steam yeah. and then ex made it the exclusive deal with Got it. Epic, Epic, Epic Games, right? to put it on the game store. This makes me happy. I think this is cool. I mean, I guess I guess there's a few ways to look at this. It makes me happy because all the people who are downloading the game on Steam saying, oh, it's going to suck because it's Epic Store exclusive. Like... I'm, I'm laughing in your face right now because that's not what you do to games. Um, but at the same yeah, time... Yeah, review bombing is stupid. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I, there should be games. You should be, be able to access games where you want, I feel like. But I, this is all business dealing, so... I don't know how to feel about this. I'm happy for the teams involved. They're yeah. making money. Good for them. The Epic Game Store deal is just too good for most developers yeah. to pass up. Yeah, especially some of those, like, what I'd call double-A developers. Mm -hmm. Like... Mm -hmm they need all of the profit they can get so steam's gonna take that giant chunk so what are the Not game great. what's slime rancher getting out of it with a free game 4.5 million i'm guessing that much like playstation subsidizes playstation plus free games yeah. i'm guessing that epic is subsidizing yeah, the free downloads in some way right like they're giving them a percentage or some kind of royalty deal, right, on the back end? I hope so, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure, like, obviously what that deal looks like, but clearly when Xbox Live, same thing, if they're going to offer something free with gold, they give the developer, you know, like a fee for each copy that's downloaded. What mm -hmm. the structure of those deals is, question mark. Right. I've never negotiated one of those, nor seen one, so don't <laughs> I know. I think this is also good, because what would make this a perfect story would be if Steam's like, okay, maybe our cuts are a little crazy, maybe we need to lower those It's not enough. One example is not enough. It's not but this is no. a good step in the right direction yeah yes. and this is also the first i think high profile game mm -hmm. that was exclusively on epic game store and we're going to be seeing more and more of those in the years speaking to come speaking of and yes. yeah, would you like to tell uh, us dun, about dun, some dun. of the uh, new the newest get that the epic game store has got. why yes i would quantic dream ubisoft lead next wave of epic game store exclusives so over at ars technica they write at game at the game developers conference presentation epic announced a number of new titles that would be coming exclusively to its epic's game store platform in the coming months chief among the acquisitions for the epic store are a selection of games from quantic dream former playstation exclusives heavy rain beyond two souls oh. and detroit become human will be coming to pc <laughs> for the first time <laughs> only via the epic game store epic said quantic dream announced back in january that it would start considering platforms beyond the playstation console family after an investment from chinese gaming giant NetEase. now they are becoming a big player in the video game space epic also announced that it is extending its partnership with ubisoft following the division 2's recent exclusive release on epic's platform several major pc releases from ubisoft will come to the epic game store according to the announcement but details on what those titles are will have to wait Ubisoft will also be adding some additional back catalog titles, including there's nothing they're not including listed here. Including nada. 
nothing. Which offers a new free mm-hmm. title every two weeks. So this is a, a huge get. I honestly did not think that Detroit Become Human would come to PC so quickly. Yeah. Because it hasn't even been a year since launch yet. When you got that big money from NetEase, yeah, anything's possible. Big well, money, I, just big thought that, I just thought that PlayStation <laughs> wouldn't release it from the platform this soon. Yeah. Like Heavy Rain, of course, it's been out forever. Oh, right. You know, even Beyond Two Souls, like sure, that's fine. But I mean, Detroit Become Human did really well for them. And it did. it's like I said, it isn't even that old. So good that's job. exciting. Yeah. This is a good get. But then again, Epic and PlayStation have had a, a really They're buddies. You know, deep relationship for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. It's just exciting that those games will actually come to PC. So if, yeah, if you were one of those people who doesn't have a PlayStation, you're like, womp, womp. now you're not going to get every PlayStation exclusive, but you can have these. Yeah. Yeah. Some heavy rain action, some Sean and Jason action. Jason! 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 <laughs> Sean! I don't know. I'm all about that Connor and Hank action. Oh, yeah, that's oh way God. better. Uh, human. I think heavy rain has one of the most awkward romance scenes ever. You don't like this, the shower sex scene? It was in the one. Oh, wait, no, that, that was different. That, that was beyond, that was, wasn't it? Yeah. No. No, no, no. I'm trying there's to think. It's the one where you have to scene. reach behind and unclasp the bra, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And the, the kissing is all like. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. I mean, you know, <laughs> that's poor how, kissing is that not yeah, that's that's right? right? <laughs> kissing physics is still, is still messed up in video games. Yeah, because they can't quite touch. Yeah. It's like when you like smash stuffed animals together. They kind of go through each other. <laughs> <laughs> how often do you smash stuffed animals together? Okay, uh, no comment. <laughs> Putting her on blast. Uh, well, that is exciting news, of course. Um, and there's even more exciting news. Steimer. Yeah. Nintendo was here at GDC this week and they revealed some Nindies. Woo-hoo! Yeah! So they were 18 games highlighted in the March 20th Nintendo Switch Nindies Showcase. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty much the headline. It's pretty much exactly what it is. More <laughs> independent <laughs> games coming to Nintendo uh, Switch. Many of these have confirmed or vague imminent release dates and there are a few that were released today. But I'm only going to highlight a few of these, the ones that I personally thought were pretty cool. Um, number one, Cuphead. Yay. So Nintendo confirmed that the formerly Xbox One console exclusive Cuphead is coming to Nintendo Switch. No mention was made of Cuphead's upcoming DLC, but Switch players can now get a taste of the beautifully animated bullet hell shooter. <laughs> I just like that term, bullet hell. Uh, Cuphead <laughs> I mean, comes brutal. to Switch on April 18th. Uh, then Rad, a new game from Double Fine and published by Bandai Namco. Rad is set for release this summer. Players will take on a character with an ability to mutate themselves, taking on the likeness and abilities of other creatures, like a snake who can reach out and snap at its foes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's not what a snake sounds like, but anyways. (laughs) Um, then Stranger Things <laughs> Stranger Things 3, the game, is also confirmed for a synchronous release with the third season that, of the hit Netflix series on July 4th. It will include co- local co-op, 12 playable characters, and we'll dive into the story of the third Ooh, season. So I was watching this while I was drying my hair today, mm-hmm. and the hair dryer was going on, but I was watching the Stranger Things footage. I don't know anything about Stranger Things, but I think co-op could be fun. How, yeah, how does, I like the art yeah. style of this game because it's like old pixely. I'm into yeah, I so we it. saw the the Duffer Brothers announce this at the Game Awards, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, at the time, not gonna lie, did not blow my skirt up. Yeah, but I was on the not Switch. very excited about what I saw. Switch and the Switch, it looks perfect. It looks perfect. And then the one that I think Brittany probably like did a little dance when she saw. Yes, she's still doing uh, that now. Cadence <laughs> of High Rule, uh, the Crypt of the Necro Dancer franchise is back with a Zelda-inspired adventure adapting the former rhythm-based exploration and the latter's rich world. This is amazing. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, I never, I'm here for this. I never played the Crypt of the Necro Dancer. Uh, there anyone? I, I yeah. will now. I've played I like now. a little bit of okay. it, but I need to like go back and play the whole thing. Yeah. So I knew they were gonna end with something, and I'm like, oh, Crypt of the Necro Dancer, maybe more content. I have no idea. And then I saw Link and Zelda, and I go, and you what? Were- <laughs> really loud in my hotel room, and I was like, oops, that was probably obnoxious. Hey, uh, it's fine. Oh, that's it. Looks cool. Now I definitely have to play it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm loving all the Zelda stuff we're getting. We're getting this. We're getting Link's Awakening. Oh yeah. So I'm still waiting for Animal Zelda. Crossing. Listen, <laughs> dear Nintendo, if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> e3 baby girl e3 uh the, i thought the red uh trailer was really funny mm-hmm. that was pretty hilarious now the red lantern is the one about the oh i can never yeah. say this so name, maybe right? re- i'll read through the list of other titles that have not been that i didn't highlight just i'm gonna say their names mm-hmm. so blaster master zero two swim sanity nuclear throne vlambeer arcade super crate box pine blood roots creature in the i think it's the is it the wall or the well I may have oh. mistyped that. I'm not sure. Um, Katana Zero, Darkwood, The Red Lantern, Neo Cab, My Friend Pedro, and Overland. 
So which mm-hmm. you were talking about the red lantern? Yeah, this is the one where you are and I I did a rod. Is that how you say it? Yeah, I did a rod. The, yeah, I said the it right. Puppers? Yeah, and it looks like a. From the gist of what I got is that you were trying to have a fresh start. You screwed something up in your past, and you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to become a sled dog Absolute, master. Yes, that's what everyone wants to do with their life, right? And I mean, yeah. Now I do. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like it's roguelike in the sense that you have a whole bunch of different scenarios that present themselves as you're mushing your puppies. And they showed one instance where they're, they're being attacked by bears. And the bear like knocks the dog off and like chomps no! on its neck. And I was and you, oh, I was like, why would you show that? But it goes to show you like some shit can go down during this. So I'm kind of interested in that. You get a bond with your puppies and pet them and just hopefully Aww. stay with them. Then they bears. get eaten by bears. No, this is what I need. Timer. <laughs> I need you with me. Can I just throw you in the back of my back, little sled back. so you can stab the bear with your knife when it comes? Because this time, I mean, this is what so you does. can prevent the bear from eating I, the dog. Yeah, I, well, just, I don't know. Yeah. She's saying in real life, I'd be in the back of her. I did her up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I see like, a bear, you can just go after it with a knife because that's what you're really good at. Uh, you know, the knife's a little close combat, so like they may have already eaten the dog by that point. I'll just go with the regular gun for this. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Hunting yeah. rifle is the way to Hunting go. Hunting rifle yeah. for preventing bears from eating the dogs. Yeah. No, if you guys, really cool. yeah, if you guys want to see any of this gameplay, I mean, Nintendo has trailers up for all of this stuff from yeah. an indie presentation from GDC this week, so you can check that out. Um, I'm really just going to skim over these next two because we got to get to the next segment. Um, Apex Legends finally had their battle pass come out there today with a new character in tow. Um, cool if you're into Apex. Um, Anthem sales open strong in the U.S. The second biggest Bioware release ever for the first month. MP- MPD Group has released its U.S. sales report for February, revealing the best-selling wow. hardware. Oh my god. Are wow. you an auctioneer? Oh my gosh, no, I'm not. Um, so Mass Effect. Wait, I jumped too far ahead. Starting with its game sales, Bioware's Anthem was the best-selling title of the month, beating out other releases like Jump Force, Far Cry New Dawn, and Metro Exodus. Anthem enjoyed the second highest launch month sales in Bioware's history, only behind 2002's Mass Effect 3. 2012. Wow. 2012. That's the number there. Yep. It is now 2019 second best selling game trailing only behind Kingdom Hearts 3. One caveat to mention with Anthem is that PC digital sales are not included and publisher Electronic Arts has not yet shared any hard sales data for Anthem. Now that's interesting because people got to play Anthem first on Origin Access for PC. So I would be very curious to know how many people actually bought the PC digital sales because it might push them even higher into the sales stratosphere for Q1 2019. But let's be honest, the Q1 games never go on to sell the most for the year. Sorry, Q1 games. It's just the way oh. it is. Um, the only one that might buck that trend is The Division 2 because from what I hear, it's on fire. Mm-hmm. It's- girl is on fire like me in the game also if you missed our happy hour q a and our after hour stream from patreon for the month of march those archives are available for you at patreon.com slash what's good games and let me tell you that after hour stream was one for the books yeah <laughs> it was very nice sing a lot <laughs> you have lovely voices Oh, wow, thank you. Say. Wow, thanks. I mean, yeah. Simon, you knew you do. I have a terrible no. voice, but I appreciate it. You're lovely. I do love it. Um, I'm not going to run down the entire yeah. list of, of the sales for February 2019. Um, just some highlights. Obviously, Anthem's at number one. Far Cry New Dawn is at number four. Red Dead Redemption 2 hanging in there in the top five. Uh, Resident Evil 2 at number six. Yes. And then, you know, there's you know the usual suspects. Your NBA 2Ks, your Call of Duties, your Minecrafts, and things like that at the bottom. Um, all right. Let's take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about some of the games that we've been playing here at GDC. Stick with us. We'll be right back. What's good, everybody? Welcome back to the second segment of the What's Good Games podcast. This is where we talk about what we've been playing, and this week, it's all about the Game Developers Conference 2019. But before we get to what we've had hands-on time with, this week's hands-on impressions are brought to you by Grammarly. Thanks to Grammarly, of course, for supporting our podcast. They are a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake-free, clear, and effective. They encourage everyone, even the best students and top professionals, to use Grammarly to do their best work and accomplish even more of their goals it's a writing assistant that makes you look and sound smarter they help me with my emails all the time start off the new year by easily improving yourself and your communication at school work and almost anywhere with grammarly they help people show their best self through writing and are available across all platforms not all platforms many platforms mm-hmm. <laughs> including online browser extensions desktop editors and mobile keyboard checkers 
like I said, you can get them in Chrome. You can get them in Firefox, Safari, Edge, and even platforms like iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. Their product, you guys, it's free. Did you know that? You can get started for free. And it has critical spelling and grammar checks. Plus, Grammarly Premium looks out for not only spelling and grammar, but also advanced punctuation, structure, style within context, vocabulary suggestions, conciseness, and readability for different occasions. Wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's important because I didn't realize, Megan, before I started using Grammarly, I tend to repeat words in emails a lot. I use Grammarly. Oh, you do? I do. So I, I am aware of the brilliance of Grammarly. Yes. I use it. No, I uh, think faster than I type. I Same. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. just, it's a blur. It doesn't it's make any sense. And I love these little weekly emails they send you. Like I'm looking at mine right yes. now. It says how many words they checked that I was more productive than 87% of Grammarly users. Well, yeah. Wow. I, I, guess I, I guess I should it's dig into my stats the system, then. right? They're yeah. making you competitive. And I use more unique words than 91% of Grammarly users. Wow. wow. A lot of my unique words are probably to jumble though. Like, wow. They're when I get like, really excited. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or they're like made up words. Yeah, they absolutely they're are. They're like, oh, what a unique word. <laughs> I know. So if you want to be like Brit, Megan, and me and get your grammar on, you guys can go to Grammarly.com slash what's good to get 20% off your Grammarly premium account today. That's Grammarly, G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y.com slash what's good for 20% off your premium account today. All right. So let's talk about what we've been playing at GDC 2019. Um, One of the most fun things that I've played so far this week, Megan, you've actually been playing as well, but just on a different platform, Beat Saber. I love Beat Saber. I feel like it's a workout. It's the only workout I get these days. And it makes me feel <laughs> just like really good at games. Doesn't it make you feel like powerful? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I love it. And and when I teach other people to play, I'm like, hit harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. Just get into it. You smash those blocks. <laughs> yeah. It's so true that you bring that up though. Cause I finally got to meet the team. Um, the, the two guys who, who make Beat Saber. And when I played it at the Oculus event, so Brittany and I were invited by uh, Facebook and Oculus to come play some of the new demos on the Rift S and the Rift Quest. And so I got to play Beat Saber on the Rift Quest without any of the wires. My fantasy. And yeah. it, it was amazing. It was so liberating because you can move around and not have to worry about the being tethered yeah. f- from your head and um i was um it was so funny because the jeff Keeley played the demo right before i did and so of course you know i said hi and gave him a, a hard time a little bit and i said what's your score i gotta go get in there and yeah. beat it and i crushed his score by more than 120 <laughs> percent was it your score like sixty nine thousand? yeah it nice. wasn't his was 20 that's I right jeff i'm well, calling you out super animated Yes. No. I he, can't. Yeah. I think he true. knew he was no. being watched too. Yeah. But I just got like, into it. I yeah. was like, "Let's go." I was playing KDA Pop Stars. Oh I was, hell yeah! And I was like, "Let's go!" And then I put it on expert and got crushed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is very difficult. <laughs> yeah. So I do love Beat Saber. Obviously, I've talked many times about rhythm and music games on this show, and playing it inside the Quest is super cool. So I can't wait. Yes, yeah, so they said. Um, they said what? Spring twenty nineteen. Uh, we got the press release from Oculus, uh, $399 it's going to be. And I believe Beat Saber is one of the launch titles. Let me look here. For Quest? For Quest. Yeah. I, yeah. I believe it is. It is. Launch title. Yep. They and they announced very many launch titles for Quest. They have not at no. all. And I tried to get some more details from them. They said that all of the tracks that are currently available in Beat Saber will be available in the Quest version. And I said, so what are you adding? And they're like, tbd so i think they know that they just weren't revealing anything when right. we saw them at the event but it was uh really fun and Brittany, you also got to play something at the oculus event oh i did it was a good life i lived that day yeah so i played a game called journey of the gods and this game is this is turtle rock's new game and i am trying to find the the gist of it oh here we go so turtle rock if you guys out there listening and watching don't know are of course the developers of the famous left for dead franchise back for blood and now they have their new zombie game that they've Uh, announced as well ah, okay so here's the description on their youtube fight as human and god alike in an epic quest to rid the land of evil moon beasts and stop the impending apocalypse. I don't know why I sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Moon beast. <laughs> Moon beast. <laughs> Moon beast. <laughs> As you journey through a primordial landscape, gaining allies and unlocking ancient powers, the Black Moon draws ever closer, coming to Oculus Quest in Rift this spring. So I hopped in because who was a lovely woman we were talking to? And Vanessa? Vanessa. And she's like, 
kind of she's she knows i like zelda she's like kind of zelda like but not 100 percent because i know people don't like comparing their games to zelda because then you're just kind of setting up for failure because it never goes well but within like five minutes i'm holding a sword i'm having a shield i have a bow and i just had this little like gaming platform where i could walk around if i wanted to no cord so it was wonderful and i mean the, the controls are really basic you know if you have your shield up you just kind of like put your hand out like this because you're using the touch controls and then you have your sword and you can like shake that around and i got to stab some things wait how do you switch to a bow because your hands you are push full. a on okay. the um on the touch controller and then it pulls out your crossbow and then what you do is you have oh, to it's a crossbow a crossbow sorry yeah cool i think it's technically yeah and then you reach out with your hand and you pull back a lever and yeah, that gets crossbow. the arrow in there yeah and then you just aim and you push um, one of the triggers and then it just shoots. So I'm like, all right, I'm, That's I'm, amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm an adventurer now. So um, <laughs> I'm an adventurer. I'm an adventurer. <laughs> Let's get the moon beast. Let's do it, the <laughs> moon beast. <laughs> and so um, they start you off and it, you open like the sandbox like, you know, you have this little area. There's a bunch of different biomes, I think she was telling me. And um, Chloe from Turtle Rock was the one who I spoke to. And the first thing it is, I got to go like walk down this grassy hill. I mean, it's very pastel-y and looks kind of cartoonish, obviously. It's not like the um, Oculus S, right? Which is all like... The Rift S. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that in just a second. So it's, you know, not like a very high definition, realistic looking environment, but still it's it's really cool. And so I got to walk down this hill. I'm in this big open field and um, I got to like smack some bushes with my sword. I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And then I was walking and I used the snap controls. I was going to say, how do you walk in this game? You, uh, uh, the analog on your left. And okay. then you, I like to do the snap. I can't do yeah. the super. The fluid. teleport. No, yeah. No, yeah. I need mm-hmm. to teleport. Too. Same. Oh, yeah. So no, I like really? to really feel like that would throw me off more. I, you'd be surprised. Yeah. I, yeah, I have found if you use like traditional stick controls with camera and movement, like you would on a controller, I get really woozy in Same. VR. I'm okay Same. walking straight and back fluidly. But when I turn, I have to use snap mm. controls. It yeah, really helps, sense. actually. Um, and so I'm just like walking around looking. This is cool. This is cool. And all of a sudden, this huge beast thing with three eyes in the middle a of its moon face. beast yes <laughs> a moon beast <laughs> a big moon beast pops up and it was a really cool moment and this is going to sound dramatic but i think it's one of those moments i'll probably never forget because for the first time i had to actually like look up at this monster that i'm defeating and we've played a lot of rpgs you know where these huge beat moon beasts come out of the ground and it's like holy crap you know you know your adventure your hero is always so small compared to some of these things but it was the first time i actually got a sensation of like this is what it's like because i had yeah, to, like, that look real up. perspective yeah. yeah and it was so cool and i had to like back up and wait for his eyeballs to show and then i would like shoot my arrow at it and then these other little things would spawn around it and you'd have to kill those two and one time i couldn't find Wait. one so i had to run around him and then like whack it with my sword Do you have like a dodge button or something no oh shit. i think that'd be really probably dizzy <laughs> no it would but i'm just like i'm thinking of those battles and i'm like you've got to move around a yeah, lot yeah obviously the controls are a little limited in that sense but sure. that would be freaking awesome so i defeated the moon beast and that was pretty cool uh, but the other part of this game is that you are a, a god of sorts and what happens you go into god mode by pushing two buttons on the uh touch controllers and then all of a sudden you have a bird's eye view and you look down at your hands and they're like these cool like demon claws and it's like oh wait god what yeah. you're a demon a demon god i'm not sure what kind of god you are. fight as a human and no god. one knows what god's hands look like that's it's true, true. To be honest. You, the god that is a nice is man a good point yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um what you can do is this is what i was doing when i was fighting the moon beast is i would you can grab trees out of the ground and pull them up and now they're, they're oh your cover because then you go trees. out of god you go out of god mode and now you're back to your little human form and the trees you've pulled up are now tall and they provide cover for mm. you as well oh. and at the end of that so I, you can't like throw the trees at the monster you you know I don't know because you can get really cool abilities. Like I got to grab lightning out of the sky and oh, then throw it. At Zeus. It. I, mean, I am Zeus. Yeah. That's amazing. I am Zeus. And uh, yeah, in God, when you get to grab um, lightning bolts and just like chuck them at the enemies on the ground, that was really cool. She was telling me there's also other abilities like fi- you can grab fire and or breathe fire or something like that. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do in this game. And this was, it was really fun and it ran really well. And I think this is a perfect game for the quest. And I just wanted to kill more moon beasts and I whack stuff VR. with my super shield. <laughs> so Megan, you just said, I love VR. I love VR. I have a lot of very good friends who make traditional video games who hate VR and don't think it's the future and it's not going anywhere. Mm. But you just listen to Brittany talk about how she'll never forget this moment in right. this game. Yeah. And you're like, no, actually that is a moment that this is something that's important to people. And I love those moments. Oh, so cool. You only experience that. In yeah, VR. in the headset. Yeah. And I have been a VR skeptic because I think some of the coolest VR 
um, development that's happening is actually not in video games. It's in other verticals outside of gaming, mm -hmm. but we're getting better and better each year yeah. as, the, as the teams out there have more time with the tech and yeah. are becoming more comfortable with it. And I think that leads me perfectly into the next thing I want to talk about, which is Insomniac Games Stormland. So Insomniac now has made four titles for VR, which is incredible that a single studio has made four games for virtual reality, considering how young the, the tech is. And uh, Magic Leap. They have a Magic Leap game too. Yeah, absolutely. So Magic Leap, for people who aren't familiar, is an augmented reality. Well, sort of an augmented reality headset yeah. yeah so it puts things in the real world so yeah. we have one here at the studio that Magic Leap sent us to test out I played the Angry Birds game oh did you yeah I don't know when's the last time you put Magic Leap on uh, at Leap uh, well we had it at Dice but, yes that's um, right they had the um, Weta Workshop game the Dr. G oh and, I never uh, saw that one. Oh, it's really fun robots come out of the walls and you oh yeah, that sounds that sounds really cool really fun so I was a little hesitant to do a, such a long demo in the roof because I f have found when I'm in VR for too long, I start to get like pretty like nauseous. Mm. So, but this was with the new Oculus Rift S. So GDC is happening as we've mentioned. And so Oculus put out all of these new details about the Rift S, which is uh, from their press release. It says it's a new VR headset that combines the convenience of built-in Oculus inside tracking technology with the full power of your PC. Built on the Rift platform, Rift S gives gamers and tech enthusiasts access to the most immersive content that VR has to offer. And it's launching spring 2019 for 399 USD. The Rift S replaces the original Rift with an upgrade to a higher resolution display improved optics and a feature called pass through plus which gives you a glimpse of the real world around you without ever taking off the headset which is a really cool idea I love it. so this is essentially like the highest resolution vr that oculus has ever created now how it's going to stack up against what vive is doing i don't know um you'll probably want to go to somebody like digital foundry for those specifics if you are super into tech data but i got to play stormland from insomniac in it and it was the most crisp picture in vr i've ever seen really it was like unbelievable i've oh never God. seen vr look this beautiful and you play as an android you i mean you essentially have like a robot You're an body android farmer yeah so that's a very key android <laughs> farmer um and i got to play in a demo where they showed us some basic movement so you know you, have, you can dual wield guns you can fly as an oh, android yeah. which is pretty cool and to fly you put your arms out like this like, like super Superman. round yeah, oh, yeah. and you can like, yeah, yeah, you can kind of like fly up and down, which was really neat. And then you can climb. So I did a climbing sequence where I was like moving my hands up and down and climbing up a wall. Mm -hmm. um, it was really neat. I mean, we were just like dipped our toes in the water with this game because the just the intro to the control scheme was so long, but really looks beautiful. I'm excited to see more from them. Um, I think they said just 2019. They didn't have a specific launch date yeah. um, for, for Stormland in the Rift S, unless it was a launch title. I don't know. So what's cool about Stormland, too, is that it's going to have co-op and multiplayer. And so you can, you can, you know, play around in these different biomes that they have. And they plan to support every week with new content. They, they plan to, it's not procedurally generated, but they're going to be going in and adding new stuff. Um, every week so. so it's almost like a games as service right. for vr which is something we haven't really seen in the mm. vr space before yeah so no motion cool. sickness when you did this and no the climbing and the flying. Yeah, you were in there a long time too we were yeah the, i was in the matrix in and the i matrix. think <laughs> i think the higher resolution makes mm. such a difference because yeah. when we talk about frame rates when you're looking at frame rate on your tv your brain is processing it different than when you're in vr and so if you have an unoptimized build or something that's pushing a lower frame rate you're going to have more tendencies to get motion sickness. I think in we've VR. all had those VR moments, right? Oh yeah, even we're years ago. Sit down in like a corner and oh, close yeah. my eyes and try Ooh. to not puke. But yeah. no, it was really impressive because I was watching Andrea play and I'm looking at what she's seeing on the TV. And I was talking with um, Tim Sal Salvid Salvid. I can't remember. I'm sorry, dude. S A L V I T T I. I think it's his last name. Uh, we met before. He helped me with Edge of Nowhere and Feral Rights with VR stuff. Anyway. um and I told him, like, God, that looks really good. He's like, it looks even better in the headset. I was like, no, no way. But that, then you said it did. And I don't think I've ever seen a VR game that looked that good before. I feel like VR always is just like a tiny bit fuzzy. Yeah. And it was interesting because I said the only other game that I didn't get any of that with that looked so crisp was actually Astrobot, another mm -hmm. one of the games that oh, you're playing, Megan. Crisp. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, no, I find myself readjusting my headset constantly Up to down. fix the fuzz. So yeah. I'm waiting for that to go away. But I, you know, work through the fuzz. Yeah, well, the, <laughs> the way that they've redesigned the headset, because previously I thought the Rift headset was incredibly uncomfortable and I could not wear it because I would put it on for 10 minutes and get these crazy lines on my face because I have a relatively small head. And so in order for me to get the headset to sit properly uh, on my face so I don't get the fuzz, yeah. I had to really clamp it down. But the new headset has a knob in the back and the the mask around the face similar is much like softer PSVR? it's like similar yeah. but it's actually even more uh like the way that it works is smoother mm -hmm. so i i put the headset on my face and then all i did was literally twist it like one like half twist mm -hmm. and it was instantly in place nice. and that's it I didn't no have to do adjusting it fast. Did not have forth. to do anything Ooh. else. Where does the weight sit? So the weight sits still on the front of your face. So, so like but the way that they've done the, the strap adjustments what? over the top of your head is that like something about the way that they're distributing the weight across the the cage on your head is different enough to the point where it didn't feel like it well, like my head was being dragged down by the weight on the front of it. Yeah. So they really did something back there, some kind of wizardry <laughs> that made it a lot more comfortable to wear for an extended period of time. Well, they have to because no one can really stay in VR for more than a half an hour with you get hot, you get sweaty, you get sore, you get yeah. dizzy. So they have that's something they have to solve. That's like, I mean, I've never super really been into VR. Um, and that's one of the reasons why. It's like, I don't want to wear something on my face. Yeah. yeah. So like, I'm kind of waiting for that day when eventually it's like glasses or something where mm -hmm. it's a little bit less intense than putting this in. Yeah. Like the well, Gear VR, what... right? Something that's a little bit light, well, lighter weight. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even, that, even better though. Makes the pass through so incredible on the new S. Mm -hmm. Is that that's something I want to be able to see without taking my headset off. Yes. It's right. Yeah, me. it's true. Or like having to like pull it off your face, like check your phone Correct. or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that'll move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I was really impressed by everything that I saw at that demo. Is it still for me? Probably not, you know, for these, all these reasons, but I really am liking what I've seen. And like, I think it's really inspiring where the tech is going and seeing what studios mm -hmm. like insomniac are doing and what turtle rock are doing and other people who are making really cool stuff for vr so i think it's only going to get better i'm so excited i agree all Put right in raccoon city <laughs> oh man no thanks give me the moon beast. i'll pass the moon beast. um all right well, let's talk just quickly um about some of the other things that we have been playing so we also got to go to the ID at Xbox event and Steimer is pointing to Falcon Age, which we saw at the, like the little bird. Yes, which we saw the at the at the mix, which we can talk about in just a second. Um, at the ID at Xbox event, which has been going on now, I think for four or five years, I still remember when they announced that program. I know, me too. So, and it's been really fun to see all of these games that we probably would have overlooked if Xbox hadn't highlighted them. So, one of the fun ones that Brittany and I got to play was After Party. Oh, yeah. So you, I think I have some notes here. Did yeah, you take I notes took, about this I year? took amazing notes, but I left my notebook in my hotel room. I like so, how you're oh, just like, okay. my notes were amazing. They were. I was, I had such an <laughs> info. Trust me. She, I was an A-plus student, and she, then I left my homework at home. She's a good note taker. I was scribbling everywhere. So this is from That's Night cool. School Studio. Yeah, yeah so this is the, from the people who made Oxenfree, if you guys ever played oh, that nice. game. I love that game. Um, yeah, Oxenfree is fantastic. If you've never tried it, highly recommend. And after party, we were intrigued right away because it's tagline Brittany what is it party your way out of hell so Ooh. yeah so essentially you have to drink your way out of hell in a drinking contest with Satan himself yeah what so you have a big cast of characters <laughs> the devil went down to Georgia but yeah. in a bar <laughs> <laughs> I love you so the demo we played well Andrew played I just took my amazing notes that I don't have um was 45 Sorry. minutes into the game and you were a cast of characters and you die and now you are in hell and you're like okay this is kind of cool but like really we want to get out of here and it turns out there is one way to escape really hell. Really get out of hell. Satan who is voiced by Dave Fenoy which is Oh really? Amazing. Oh he's and, so wonderful. And Lola one of the two main characters so it's Milo and Lola is voiced by uh, Janina Gavankar which was like oh, I recognized awesome. her voice you know, like yeah. instantly. And then Ashley Birch is in there too I think right? Yeah, yeah I it's think a so. great lineup of uh, voice actors so yeah in order to get out of hell you have to out drink and out party Satan. 
And so how this game works I feel is like Andrea could. I'm gonna be a professional yeah. at this. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, it's so good. And you have to become like cool enough to go talk to him and actually like because every night he throws a rager and then you go like a raver is rager is that rager. What you rager. Yeah. And you have to I know right I'm like is it raver or is it rager I'm so stupid. Um. So then you have to. You're not stupid. I'm saying it with love. I love anyway. So you you get drinks at the bar and there's a bunch of different bars. I think they said seven different bars and each drink you have makes your personality different in the sense that it'll obviously like you know you drink tequila maybe you get happy you drink whiskey you become even weirder like i do anyway it gives you different dialogue options and those dialogue options can impact the decisions you make and the way you interact with people around you yeah this i'm just it's really excited and i'm ready to play right now let's play this, this is absolutely, absolutely up your alley and yeah. for sure. super vulgar like the names of the drinks are like bloody stool and like stupid stuff oh like no that. that's gross and i thought you like <laughs> that yeah, the, uh, the, the descriptions of the drinks are yeah. also very disgusting and we asked the team um from night school who was who were there like do you guys tried to like make these in the real world and they're like we tried, we tried. and it did not go very well yeah. and i, I said recommend. challenge accepted <laughs> oh my yeah, god yeah i was just laughing the whole time because it, it, it is funny and there's a lot of swearing and it's like that really funny humor potty humor that i love and yeah the yeah. dialogue is really well yeah. done so it's essentially like a like a, a narrative adventure game where you know you have these interactions with characters and you have dialogue trees so you get to pick totally. you know and yeah. then if like let's say it's a binary choice and if you've had a special drink it can give you a, a tertiary choice that's unique to the drink that you've ch- uh, you've drank right. you i'm drink doing something... a tequila only run let's go <laughs> you did something that made you super aggressive i did and so, so i just wanted to fight everybody yeah. so all the dialogue options that came up Wait, while i was on this drink? um it was called i can't remember it was like a, a like a bull something like some oh, kind of a shot so like oh, a bull yeah. buster shot or something, something. I don't know. um and, and it, the bull you get the horn yeah yeah so and you then, were playing beer pong right and so the so in the good. demo that we played you have to get upstairs to this section of the party in order to do so you have to make it past a bouncer but the bouncer doesn't have your name on his list and so you have to go find the guy who's running the party and impress him enough so that he puts your name oh on the God. list mm-hmm. so essentially yep. you have to go through a bunch of satan's like lackeys and henchmen before you get the opportunity to actually talk to satan yeah. himself right so he's got these like underlings that you have to impress and so the first demo that we played was in order to impress this guy he challenged us uh one of his friends challenged us to a game of beer pong um and so of course i was like ah beer pong i got this but the more you drink the drunker you get and the more difficult it is to sink the and you have to talk real life exactly (laughs) it's exactly like real life. real life yeah it was really good yeah, so it's uh, super fun. Um, I think this is going to be a winner for sure. The cast of characters looks amazing. They said, you know, the difference, a, mi- a big difference between this and Oxenfree is that Oxenfree had a pretty small cast and this has a very large cast. Right. So a lot of different types of characters and lots of demons, lots of monsters, typical things you would find in hell, lots of jokes about like, yeah, hell sucks. Of course it does. It's hell. Yeah, um, it's supposed to suck. And they were yeah. also saying that, you know, the hell takes, you know, obviously millions of years. People have been going to hell, right? And so they said you're going to find a wide cast of characters people who've been there for so long i think it's going to be a really funny game i think it's going to win awards yeah yeah all right the only thing is like i know this was an xbox event but i'm like i want to play this on a switch so i I believe they told us let me check my well, notes. Sorry, I love you very much. I know eventually, eventually. it will make it there. Did I write this down? I thought I asked them if this was an Xbox exclusive, and I think they said no. Oh. I also, yeah. Let me. Hello, see. after party. Come to my Nintendo after Switch. After party game. So Night School, that's an LA studio, I think, right? I believe yeah. so. Oh yeah, Oxen Free Developers' next project after party has been <gasps> confirmed for Switch. Hell yeah! <laughs> there you go. And that broke June of 2018. When oh. is it coming? When is 20, it coming? It just says 2019. Yeah. Damn it! And when we asked them, they said 2019. Well, no one we know. We, oh, I right. mean, that's I appreciate that more than a date that gets pushed. So yeah, that's fine. Uh, agreed. Mm-hmm. Just wait nine months. It's fine. Yeah. Wait. It was pretty, less than nine it was, months. I was like. Uh, uh, yeah to make it into 2019 yeah mm-hmm. yeah like just exactly nine months yeah, yeah. we also should talk about hyper dodge yeah for like a minute. of course so this is Gl- glitch is that the developer yes okay yeah and it's just one guy i was talking to him his name is charles mcgregor and this has been his game he's been working on for three years now and it's coming out just 2019 question mark at the end a of lot it. of the games we saw at the showcase were like mm-hmm. sometime this year sometime this year so andrew and i were walking done. around at the event and I have her name here you have it eva 
Eva, I believe. Ava. Ava, who was helping him out, she came up. She was like, hey, you know, I like this show. Can I just take basically 30 seconds of your time, show you this cool game? We're like, 30 seconds, of course. And then, of course, that turned into like 15 minutes. Because I had, got super competitive. Well, we, got, we had a lot of fun with it. <laughs> what? Yeah. You don't yeah. say. I know. I'm the worst. So what's interesting about HyperDot is it's kind of like a bullet hell, um, but not so essentially it's like a co it's a, it's a competitive bullet hell where um there's d these different arenas so the first arena we were in kind of reminded me of a petri dish or, so like the arena was circular and you all have these little dots on screen that you control and the goal is to just and Brittany's pulled up a video here the goal is to just essentially not touch all of the things coming across the, oh across God. the screen oh God, it's like very much like a wars, like a just of? shapes and beats um if you guys and have like, played that the opposite because you're not firing anything you're yeah just i mean very traditional bullet hell right just yeah. don't let the things on the screen hit you or you're dead and then they have I'm really bad at that yeah they have all <laughs> these different game so modes yeah and so they have modes where you collect things they have modes where like britney has on screen right now where you have to stay inside of, of a hill kind a of. smaller circle inside the arena um, and then they have modes where like your um, player icon is really big and so it makes it more difficult to navigate around oh and then God. you can take a couple of hits and then there's some modes where you can only take one hit there's it's for one to four players mm -hmm. they have a campaign with over a hundred levels and what I was really impressed by by how quickly it loads when you die because this is that kind of game where you need an instant retry right. and it delivers like you die and it's like you're right back in there instantly trying again um, and the really simple graphic style makes it easy to see even though those little pentagons, when they come across the screen, <laughs> they can move faster than the other ones, which I didn't realize. That's why they kept mm -hmm. screwing up my life. But yeah, <laughs> it's, it's really fun. Like you said, just pick up and play. It'd be something fun to play on one of our after hour stream, right? Just you pick up, you play, you die, you keep playing. And it's never, it's not like you're actually competing with each other. I mean, you are, but you're not trying to actually kill it. Well, I guess you can move each other. There's little dots around. Yeah, there's yeah. definitely, this is definitely a competition game. But it's for not sure. like, oh, I'm trying to so think we like should a, not play this. No, no, we should. <laughs> it's not the kind of game where you get mad at the other person if they win. Unless are you you're sure? Well, Do you like, remember what just happened over the weekend? <laughs> Do friendships almost get ruined at these? You yeah. know what happens sometimes when we play slightly competitive things. <laughs> yes. But we, this one I think yeah. we could do. But no, it's yeah. really fun. A fun party game to throw up on the TV. And I'm really impressed. And I hope it does really well because Charles is a great person. Was he was really shot. nice. Yeah. Even though he conveniently won a lot of the matches I mean, that he was game. playing against us. I was like, maybe you should be sitting out player three. Because he was player three and player three always kept winning. And I was like, of course you're winning. It's your game. You should stop playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just let us lose against well, each other. Uh -huh. Um, well, folks at ID at Xbox do a really amazing job of finding these like crazy wacky games that you might not find anywhere else. This one guy, yeah, making a game. Yeah, like exactly. That. It was it, really fun. It's been um, it's been really awesome seeing the the growth of that program and yeah. how Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo, you know, talking about indies, have really supported independent um, publishers and really just love finding gems that you would never ever otherwise right. probably find because discoverability is still such a huge issue for indies in the space. But Brit also, of course, if you follow me on Twitter, you saw that she found the scary <sighs> game at the found showcase. I love scary games. games. What? I, am a, I, I, I love scary VR is my favorite thing. You guys are both yes! monsters. Oh <laughs> you ever play you are now best friends. No. Oh, I'm let me find it. Let me find me. it here. Silver Chains. Okay. So Silver, Wait, Silver Chains is the scary oh. game? Silver yeah. Chains, yeah, from Head Up Games. It is a heads. first person horror game with a strong emphasis on story and exploration. Search for clues within an old abandoned manor to unravel the truth about the terrible events which have happened here. So Q3 2019 is mm, release date. Or I would just it. like leave the house. So yeah, so of course this game. <laughs> so I would just turn around and walk out. Be like, you know what? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I've been getting press releases for this game for a while and I just haven't had the chance to check it out. And I sat there and I waited and I was like, I'm going to freaking play this game. So I did. So what's good about this because I also have that same thing where it's like you, you if this if this is real life you would turn around and get the hell out of here right so apparently I don't know what happened the demo starts and you crash into a tree I'm not sure in what way you crash into a tree but you did and you're all like hurt you're limping toward this abandoned mansion manor way up yonder and you get in there and then it's the naive thing of like oh I hope someone here can help me you get in you're exploring clearly there's no one there you see a ghost and the main character's like, there's ghosts in here. I got to get out of here. I'm like, thank yeah, you. I guess. <laughs> thank you. And a, then, a real reaction. A real reaction. And of course, it's not that easy to get back because now doors are like locked. Sure. And things okay. Are yeah. Things have changed behind yeah. you, basically. So it kind of reminds me of 
I don't know, because I Layers of Fear is the first thing that comes to mind, except for in this game, you actually have to hide because mm. things will chase you and try to So, kill like, you. a little oh. bit of Outlast oh. and Layers of Fear. Outlast, Layers of Fear-esque. And what I really like about this is that there is the emphasis on exploration. You're going around, you're finding pieces of paper. Like, you learn that some shit really went down in this house, and now apparently there's evil spirits that want to kill you. Um, Sounds about right. And there's, like, light puzzle elements. You have to find keys for locks. In one room, you had to find four pieces of a picture and put them together, and then that unlocks a door. So I'm playing this. I'm like, this isn't too scary. And granted, you know, the headphones were kind of quiet because that room was so loud that it, I couldn't get all of the sense of what like was going on. the ambient sounds, yeah. Right, and that's really what kind of makes or breaks a horror game. Well, you and me slender. We know that. <laughs> that was the scariest People were like, I've this ever didn't been. seem scary. We're like, you didn't have the headphones on. Put on the headphones. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, you know, you're going around, you see, like, the back of a, of a ghost, and you're like, okay, like, that's creepy, but not the scariest thing I've seen in a game whatsoever. And then, like, a little piece of paper gets slid underneath a door, and it says, Pl- come play or play with me. And nope. that's no, nope, that's nope, when I nope, turn around. Nope. And that's when I that's looked at the like developer this. and I was like, no, no. And I was like, dang it, this is getting real. And then maybe about three quarters of the way through the demo, I hear someone whisper in my ear, nope. a little kid, she's coming nope. or something. Nope. I was like, oh, yeah. cool. Nope, nope. Great. Nope, nope, and nope. then one of the most hideous creatures I've ever seen in all of gaming, it's like, it looks like Slender Man woman, but with hair and a big, weird, funky face. And she's like tall and skinny and lanky. And she's like kind of moving around she the house. She like hands? Yeah, I think she has claw hands. I'm pretty sure she has claw hands. I don't know. I Seems saw her. Standard. And I'm like, I gotta find a closet. And then you have to go in the closet. And then she's like skittering around outside. No. no. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. it was so good. Why I, do you want to do this to yourself? I don't know. It's, it's exciting. It's, maybe it's the adrenaline. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, she was hideous. Because at first, I'm like, this isn't that bad. This is just a story about little ghost children. Wait, so it's a little ghost children. Like, that's actually a helpful ghost. I if think. she's saying that, like, oh, she's coming. That's like, oh, crap maybe you are being helpful and then the other thing i don't trust ghost children though i mean you know i trust i trust them more than i trust the creepy lady oh yeah the the creepy lady absolutely wants to kill you they might be in it together i don't know know. what what if that child is like newt in alien and she just needs help yeah i will we'll have to find out i guess we will (laughs) i don't know it's not like that kid in which one was it where the kid ran up and chased us and we screamed and then we I, oh like, that was slender was it still yeah slender? that was slender the arrival remember the little the little oh, yeah tommy i think his yeah. name was this isn't vr though this is no uh, this is xbox this one is yeah xbox and steam i'm looking at right mm-hmm. now but uh yeah i mean it you know as soon as i saw the closet and the option to hide i was like oh no that's amazing i know where this is going but yeah i mean i it, Wait, how do you know when you can get out um well, I, I would even, just stay in the closet for the rest of the game. You know, actually, yeah, because I was yep. in the closet and the developer was behind me. And I was like, can I leave yet? He's like, no, don't leave yet. So oh I God. think once she, I saw her kind of disappear into a cloud of smoke and then I assumed it was safe to get out. Oh, okay. But I don't know. Wait, so you're, you can, you're peeking yeah, you, through. Yeah, there's, there's a, cre- uh, a crack in the okay, closet so you that you can like, look through. And on. you can kind of like look and left or right and you see her like, like running around outside. And you're like, no, 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 no. Nope. Oh, yeah. Definitely excited about this one. I need to go home. I like the exploration aspect of it. So yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm good. I'm with Steimer here. You guys are so Whatever. Funny. Can we talk about an adorable game about birds? <laughs> yes, that'll be the last one for this segment. Um, so I've been meaning to get my hands on Falcon Age for quite some time. Um, we've seen it at several shows mm. over the last like, year or so. Of course, Falcon Age is coming to PlayStation 4 and PlayStation VR. And I believe we're going to spend some time with the VR demo at PAX East. So mm. we'll have to give mm. you guys an update because we played it on the, the regular 2D version on PlayStation 4 at The Mix, another staple GDC event featuring tons of indie games. So um, Falcon Age, for people who are not familiar, I'm going to just go to the little blurb here. Um, from Outer Loop Games. Falcon Age is a first-person single-player action adventure as Ara learned to hunt, gather, and fight to reclaim her cultural legacy and the lost art of falcon hunting against a force of automated colonizers. Falcon Age is coming to PS4 with optional PSVR support. So essentially, you start off the game as Ara, and um, it says that you've been wrongfully thrown in jail for a minor infractions. While she awaits her fate in a lonely cell, she passes the time by befriending a young falcon. Together, they escape and set off on an adventure to help the resistance reclaim their freedom and drive off the invaders so this is coming sometime in 2019 yes so cute okay yeah no baby the baby falcon is the adorable best. oh my god and i want him we um we saw um a couple of different things that um the falcon can do so you essentially are have your two hands in your right hand you have this almost like this whip like um weapon and then on your left hand is where you call um the bird 
And so uh-huh. you, you can send the bird to attack things. Um, she can go out hunting. And it was funny because when we were talking to Eka, one of the developers on the game, um, I was like, why did you go with a female falcon? And he was like, well, we found out that male falcons are actually pretty dumb. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, the female falcons are smarter, they're faster, they're bigger. So they were like, why would we not want to just use the female falcon? It, right? <laughs> so good. It's so funny. I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> um, and, so, and some of the gifts that they have on the website is like, you can... Um, th- like there's, fist bump. Yeah, there's like a little love button that you hit. You can do all these little things. Um, like you oh, can put your hands yeah. together to make a heart. Uh, you know, when oh, you put your put finger, and it puts his little face through it. Or oh, oh. you can pick him and turn him around. Oh, and my it, God. it fills up their health. Oh, it's so cute. Oh, yeah. So when you interact with your bird like that, it fills their, their health yeah. meter. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah. And there's a whole cooking and crafting element where you can. Cook co- the bird? You no. Can, no, you cook. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, you don't cook the falcon. No, you cook. <laughs> How dare you? Do you see how adorable this <laughs> yeah, little baby no, bird you is? You cook treats. treats for the falcon. Ah, uh, my bad. So they give um, the bird like a health boost. Oh, yeah, because yeah. there's little bunnies and stuff, and you can tell your falcon to go get the bunnies and then it brings back this a little adorable piece of meat that you then yeah so with. when you go hunting with your bird right. yes. so there's rabbits in the world that your falcon can hunt and when the falcon has successfully killed one of the rabbits they bring the meat back in in its claws and it's shaped like a rabbit head yep it's like the rabbits are cute so we're not like the- i think they're <laughs> kind of cute. cute they're cute the ones in the game aren't that cute okay good. thankfully so you don't feel bad like about monster killing rabbits them. correct right. the bird right. is way cuter <laughs> oh and, and you can dress buddy. yeah and you can dress she. dress your bird up yeah so you can put lots of little out, uh, outfit pieces on her Top she hat. can wear like bandanas hats so bow ties i'm like this is the best game ever yes. i think oh yes so it looks super cute. We hope to spend more time with it at PAX. Like I said, we're going to give you guys an update once we get uh, to play it in VR because Echo was like, you have to come back and play it in VR. And I was yes. like, don't worry, we will. We'll see you at PAX. So um, yeah, it's going to be really fun. So just some highlights. You can bond with your bird. You can hunt with the falcon. You can craft falcon snacks, accessorize your falcon, fight the robot colonizers, reclaim your land. And then there's a challenge-free mode, which allows you to play the story with optional combat. So when oh, we that's were, right. So when we were talking to him, he said one of the things that we really wanted to add to the game that wasn't part of the original vision was an exploratory mode where you can just go out in the world with your bird and kind of hang out because he said that they played with um, a lot of families with kids who really kind of gravitated towards the falcon and wanted to be friends with it and play the game but that the combat was just too difficult for some of these younger kids so he's like why don't we just make a like a free play mode and so they've now added that into the development of the game which i mm-hmm. thought was really That's cool really cute yeah, yeah. That. so that's like a really good tamagotchi but with a bird Kind of, yeah. There we yeah. go. It's a good way of looking at it. Hmm, okay. So I don't know if Outer Loop has given an official release date. I think it just says 2019 still. Yeah, PS4 in 2019. Um, of course, it's built specifically for PSVR using the Move controllers or DualShock 4. So expect you know some fun motion controls, which we will again report back on. All right, so that's going to do it for our hands-on segment for the week. I know a lot of you out there are still playing The Division 2, and we will reconnect with you guys on that next week. Um, Hopefully, I'll get to some of the endgame content after GDC is done, and so when we check back in with you, we can um, let you know how level 30 The Division is playing. Um, So we will get back to you guys on that. But for now, let's take a short break, and we will see you in a minute. What's good, everybody? Welcome to the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. And this week, our feature segment is all about the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences. And it's brought to you by Quip. One of the most important things we do for our health every day is brushing our teeth. Yet, most of us don't do it properly. Quip is a better electric toothbrush created by dentists and designers. It was designed to make brushing your teeth more simple, affordable, and dare I say, enjoyable? It's got sensitive sonic vibrations that are gentle enough on even the most sensitive gums and why is this important because people brush too hard and some electric toothbrushes are just too abrasive and it also has a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to remind you when to switch sides helping guide a full and even clean because up to 90 percent of us don't brush for a full two minutes or don't clean evenly that's right i've already told you guys guilty as charged that 30 second pulse reminds me i have to brush my teeth for at least 30 seconds (laughs) A multi-use cover. Side, not like total. <laughs> I mean, you're supposed to brush for a full two minutes, yes. but sometimes, you know, you're in a hurry in I the morning. Have I had to remind myself, have you felt the pulse yet? No, keep that toothbrush in your mouth and keep brushing. <laughs> 
A multi-use cover is also a very handy part of Quip that mounts to your mirror and unmounts the slide over your bristles for on-the-go brushing. It declutters your sink or cabinet and makes traveling with an electric toothbrush easier. And it doesn't require a clunky charger and runs for three months on a single charge. Mm. So... We use Quip. We love Quip. I have it with me while I'm up at GDC. It's keeping my teeth clean for all those game demo appointments we're doing. And it's backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just 25 bucks. And if you go to getquip.com slash what's good right now, you'll get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash what's good for your free refill pack. All right. Megan Scavio is here. She's been on the yeah. show. I'm so glad that we finally get to talk a little bit about the Academy of Interactive yeah. Arts and Sciences because I feel like every time I bring it up, usually around the Dice Awards, <laughs> people are like, what's that? I mean, when I left GDC to go to the Academy, I went, I asked everyone I knew, do you know what the Academy is? And <laughs> seasoned video game developers, no idea what the Academy is. And that's kind of what I'm here to do is kind of to change that. But what it, what it really is, it was a nonprofit founded in 1996 by a bunch of uh, publishers and developers in, they founded the Dice Awards. So what they wanted to do, I think it was called the Academy, the AIAS Awards at the time, but boy, that's a mouthful. It really <laughs> is. I would love to change that. But it was um, an effort to celebrate the craft of video games. So they were the first peer driven video game ceremony in the industry. So they award, uh, on, based on craft and discipline, so art direction, animation, technology, and obviously best in game and others. So uh, it's a peer-based group, and it's been going on for over 20 years, and now we want to grow it. We want to, or what I want to do is expose gamers to how games are made. Like, why is, why did God of War win best? Why, why did uh, Spider-Man win best animation last year? Why, was that the only category it won? It should have won more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to I want to try to increase visibility for that the real developers out there, not just the guy who's out there, Corey, we love him, but he's out there, he's a spokesperson for that game, but it's made by so many other people with so many other skill sets and I want to talk about them and expose them more to the a general audience. I think that that is such a fantastic like mission for the Academy because people that listen to this show or watch the show are clearly fans of video games, but not all of them have even the remotest clue like how a video game gets made. I mean, I think we're, we're all included there. Like we, we know a lot more than the average bear, right. but there's still so many roles within a development studio that I have no idea what they do. Or you've got people who just go, why didn't you ship that with a multiplayer? Because they don't understand what goes into Because it's so it. easy, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> that. right. So let's take them through some of that process and teach them a bit more about how video games are really made and the people who make them. Because it's not just, also, it's not just a typical who you think makes a video game. There are lots of women. There are lots of LGBTQ. There are lots of people of color. There, every single person you could imagine makes video games. So I want to put that out there, too, and kind of normalize the fact that it's a very diverse group of people and artists, really, who make the games we love. Yeah, it's so fascinating looking at a show like the Game Developers Conference this week and seeing people from all over the world kind of converse to, to share knowledge and to do these talks that are happening all week long at the convention center where people really come to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I am always so inspired by how many different types of people come from so many different countries around the world because i think sometimes we get into our own silos and our own bubbles of like oh, oh th like only i only know studios that are from american companies right but like there's so many companies that don't even make games in english right and even the people working within the studios very rarely get outside of their studio mm -hmm. so providing a way for them to network with each other i talked to um someone from Campo Santo who's the uh, environmental artist there. And she's just like a mentor to young artists all over the place. But she's like, sometimes I need help. Sometimes I want to talk to a peer. And I'm the only environmental artist in the building. So how can I connect those people too so that they have an outlet? So that's another one of my jobs that I have to figure out how to do. Yeah, well, you guys are doing so many cool initiatives. One of the things we were talking about before we started recording was this scholarship program with the foundation. Yeah, so we have a charitable arm of the uh, AIAS Foundation, the Academy of Interactive Arts, and we have two goals. We provide tuition assistance to students who want to enter game careers, 
and game programs in schools. And then we have uh, scholarships for underrepresented game developers, developers to advance their careers. Just on Sunday of GDC, we hosted Amplifying New Voices, which is uh, that we bring 36 underrepresented developers. They've been in the industry three to six years. They've shipped one to two games, and they want to now be representatives of their games and not talk about who they are mm. in the industry, but what they do in the industry. So we provide them, we provide them uh, professional headshots. We help them rewrite their professional bios. We give them on-camera speaker training. So we film them doing a presentation, and then we critique it afterwards. And we give them on-camera media training and do the same where they, we ask them the hard questions. Well, if you ever need help, we'll, we'll, we'll come in and ask some questions. Too. <laughs> I, should, I should do that, actually. Maybe we'll do that next year. I have a reputation for asking all the questions that are like, we're not quite talking oh about that God. yet. Andrew, that is such a good idea because uh, a, a media person comes in and gives them a half hour of training that's actually really quite valuable. I take notes. Even. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then they we have to give them... We ask them to throw curveballs and stuff. We should bring you next time. Hey, man, put me it. in, coach. I'm ready to play. But then hopefully, <laughs> you know, they go out there and they, um, and then they get a free GDC pass and give them, give them a thousand dollar travel stipend. But hopefully, they can go out there and that's amazing. Be interviewed by you guys instead. No one teaches you how to do that stuff. Oh, that's no, exactly yeah. you know right. what I mean. No one teaches you how to act on camera, what to say. How, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what I'm doing half the time. No, and I want to normalize the fact that. The industry is made up of such a diverse group of people. I don't want it to just be, hey, I'm a lady. I'm going to sit and talk about being a lady in games. I want sure. just to put a lady out there to talk about the game she made or the role that she took in making her role that she had in making that game. Um, and yeah, we were talking earlier. There's so many different types of people in the game industry. Uh, I told you we were launching a 5K race this year. Yeah, it's yeah. super exciting. The very first video game industry 5K race, the AIS Foundation bet run in April here in Los Angeles, or I'm sorry, there in Los Angeles. I'm not there right now. <laughs> uh, Insomniac will be there. Naughty Dog will be there. Sony Santa Monica will be there. But there's a lot of like very athletic people who make games, which always surprises me. They're not just people who sit behind computers all day. They're triathletes and Iron Man. It's crazy. And for people who do live in the Los Angeles area, this is not limited just to game developers. Anybody can sign up for this. Anyone can sign up. It goes, all, all of the proceeds go to fund our foundation uh it's 50 dollars a ticket anyone can go and race and and race against people who made spider-man like yeah you just like run alongside you like <laughs> yeah. oh, hey, what did you work on no, exactly. like, i don't want to talk to you right now i'm running That's so funny. there'll be donuts afterwards share what, donuts, donuts yeah. after steimer's in I you, might, you, might have, you may have just gotten yourself another person since i broke a toe i'm considered just being the person who like throws donuts at people while they're running i don't want that job <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> I think it's really important what you're doing because I think there's this idea that a game just comes out of almost thin air. I mean, obviously right. not, but they don't, people, your average consumer doesn't quite realize how much blood, sweat, and tears, and emotions, and sacrifices go into making a game like this. And right. I think humanizing that actually could go a long way for reducing the toxicities. That's that a perfect see. word. It's just humanizing the fact that games are made by human beings and let's treat, it, treat them that way. Yeah. So I feel like I need to start training now. What date is this? What, the, I mean, what date it's, in April? It's April 13th. It's on the beach, Dockweiler Beach. Um, oh, it's great gonna, down there. It is right down there. I, you know, I wanted to make it somewhere pleasant looking, even though it's, I think it's by the airport. But it's, it's just south water. of the airport. Yeah, it's just yeah. south of the airport. But we'll keep doing this every year, and I really think it's going to grow, and maybe we can even take it to other cities so that other people who don't live in the Los Angeles area can participate. That would be awesome. Yeah. And so if you guys are interested, uh, where can people find more details about where to sign up for this 5K bit run if they want to participate? Uh, interactive.org. That is the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences website. Um, they also have details there about the scholarships that the foundation does. Because um, you guys do grants throughout the year as well. We do two sets of grants. We do grants during um, the first half of the year and the second half of the year. And, and people have to apply and you have to show need. Um, we get a close to 100 applications and we only accept about um 12 so so highly competitive highly competitive but i mean if you're out there maybe one of those people could be you maybe you want to make a game and don't know how and need some help can you give an example of somebody that has been granted a grant in the past? Uh, well they're well they're scholarships so ah. we, we pay 2500 dollars towards your tuition so oh, okay, we'll, we'll literally help pay for your school 
And then we bring you to a Dice Summit so that they can actually interact. I've got to meet people. so many of these students you, over the last couple right. of years. Um, I got invited to uh, a ladies' lunch table by our mutual friend, Perrin Kaplan, who works in the industry for Zebra Partners. And um, she's always so good about connecting people. And so she pulled about like six or seven of these students yeah. from at, at Dice um, with a bunch of other um, industry leaders. And then she's like, Andrea, you come over here too. And I'm like, I don't belong at that table, but okay. <laughs> um, and so I was there um, and we got to meet some of these students and hear about what they're working on and where they're from and it was just so inspiring to see this amazing generation of future game makers and the visions that they have and the work they're putting in because when i was in school that wasn't an option no, no. you know a literal future game makers one of our scholarship recipients was standing in line for lunch a couple of years ago next to min kim who was from nexon and then founded bonfire game studios he hired her <sighs> by having conversations with her in the lunch line at dice what? He ended up, she works at Bonfire now. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, know. I know. Also, so, maybe I should talk to more people in lunch line. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's how you network. Well, that's one of the things that, you know, I always give advice to people. I mean, we get asked all the time, like, how do we get into games? How do we break in? I'm sure you get asked constantly. Yeah. And I said, like, you never know who you're going to meet. You have to network, 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 network. Always go to every event you're invited to. Go out of your way to break down some of, you know, your... Um, maybe your social reservations and just put yourself out there and say, hi, this is my name. Here's my business card because you never know who you're going to meet. I mean, I've been in the game industry for 20 years and I find that most people in the industry are crazy nice. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they are willing to talk to you. They're willing to talk to anyone. It's video games. They're, they make video games. We all They're, share one yeah. mutual passion. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, no one, no one should be afraid to just walk up to someone and start a conversation. Indeed. Do you have any other cool things that the AIAS is working on? Uh, there's some, there's one new program that I'm working on, which is a new member-driven program uh, that will help eventually uh, take over how the awards are run and determine the categories and the nominees and the winners. Uh, but that might be a couple of years in the making, but we're just starting it now. I held a little um, private secret meeting during DICE where I invited a bunch of very seasoned game developers to help give me advice and tell me what to do. And they sure did. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, they have some opinions. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to ask, man. Yes. I mean, no, it was really nice because I like to be very transparent in what we do. Uh, so they, they reiterated that that's what they want more of. So get ready for that. Yeah. Well, that's Ooh. awesome. A transparent president. What a novel idea. <laughs> now, I'm so excited that you are at the helm of AIAS. Obviously, lots of developers probably expressed their sadness when you left GDC. But having, you know, the ability to call you Madam President of the Academy is not only just like as, as your friend is something that I'm like super proud to do. But also, I think I've told you this before. And we get so many women that watch the show that say like having us be in the spotlight has helped them. And I think having I someone like you at the top of this leadership organization like helps those women also say hey if Megan yeah. can be the president of the Academy I can maybe do it one day too it's all about representation and that's what we all have to do is help others get to where we are and that's that's my goal and maybe have some fun, play some games, and drink some tequila along the way. Yeah. Oh, tequila's right after this, I'm told. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Perfect. thank you so much for making time during GDC to come down and be on the show. We've thank been you. wanting you here forever, and this has been such a treat. And again, if you guys want to learn more about the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, the website is interactive.org, and the bit run is happening on April 13th. You can still sign up on their website. And of course, you guys know where to find us, what's good games.com slash podcast, YouTube dot com slash what's good games thanks everybody we've got special guest R marissa roberto on the show yeah. next week because timer's going to be on vacation um so look forward to that episode and we'll see you guys at pax bye everybody bye.